Welcome to the Economic Rockstar Podcast with your host, Frank Conway. Connecting brilliant minds in economics and finance. Hello and welcome back to the Economic Rockstar Podcast. And in this episode, I look back on the best of 2018 Part 2. And I decided again to take some kind of theme from it. So I look back on some of the episodes in which some of my guests talk about their upbringing through the Great Depression and their formative years, such as Vernon Smith and Harry Markowitz. But also I go beyond and then look at futurism in an episode with Kevin Kelly. And within these two so-called time periods from the Great Depression and beyond, I also look at some of the conversations I've had with other academics or other economists and we talk about institutions, individualism and cooperation as well as reciprocity in game theory. So these include episodes with Jennifer Burns where we talk about Ayn Rand and her idea of capitalism and also the virtues of selfishness as well as Naya Hata's discussion on Eleanor Ostrom's work on collective action. So it's nice to get a, a rounded perspective on things and look at the two almost polar opposites if you want to isolate them that way in terms of these elements in economics so enjoy this episode looking back on a number of previous guests who were featured in 2018 episode 123 with vernon smith on his early childhood years during the great depression and how they survived by moving to live on a farm before losing it all his mother as a socialist and who she voted for in the presidential elections in 1919 when women were first given the right to vote in the United States. Well, yes, Frank, I can, you know, I'm a child of the Depression in the sense that I was born in 1927, and, uh, you know, the, the we, we started in the, in the Depression two years later, and so my earliest memories were one of kind of considerable uh, family hardship. And uh, my father was laid off. He was a machinist. Uh, and he worked for a, a, a tool company, a Bridgeport o- uh, oil equipment company in Wichita. And they made all sorts of, of uh <clears throat> tools and equipment that were used in the oil field. Well, he was laid off, but we had a farm. And now, how, why would people of modest means own a farm? Well, my mother's first husband had been killed in 1918 in a train wreck. He was a f- fireman on the Santa Fe Railroad. He was killed, and there was an insurance settlement for that. So uh, my mother was widowed with two young girls uh, in 1918. A few years later, she married my father, and uh, they uh, invested the money in the farm. So uh, when my father was laid off, uh, we moved to that farm. That was in 1932. I was five years old, and I remember that very vividly. The farm to me, it was a, uh, uh, oh my gosh, it was like heaven to me. I just loved it there. You got to, you got to, uh, you learned all about animals and farm work and harvests and this sort of thing. And 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 uh, and then we moved back when I was seven. Uh, two years later. So it was a period of considerable uh, struggle for my family, but <clears throat> but we we ate well. That's one of the reasons why we moved uh, to the farm. We always had, uh, you know, fr- fresh milk, and we had chickens, and we would harvest a pig every so often. And we had fruit trees, vegetable gardens, and all of that. So I grew up in a world where there was sort of a, a seamless connection between uh, fruit trees, gardens, and a chicken yard, and the kitchen. And my mother cooked on a, on a, a wood stove. The, the, the house had no indoor heating. Uh, the pump, the water pump was about 30 feet from the back door, 
and and you and you cooked on a wood stove. So that was the that was the two vivid uh, most vivid years in my memory, age five to seven. And you know, I went to a one room schoolhouse. Almost no one is left anymore who went to school in a one room schoolhouse. And I'll just tell that, I'll tell you a story about that, and then I'll pass it back to you, Frank. That ought to give us a pretty good introduction. My teacher was Mr. Hamburger. Now, notice the teacher was a man. Most people go to school, and their teachers were, were women. Well, on the farm, uh, we lived, and it was a German community, uh, a, a, a community of immigrants. Had, who had come over probably 10 to 15 years uh, earlier. And this particular uh, man, Mr. Hamburger, uh, well, he knew uh, arithmetic, he knew reading and writing in English as well as German. So in that community, he was the teacher. And after all, there's only three subjects, reading, writing and arithmetic, what else is there in those days? And you and, the, and that was the instruction, and it was actually quite good instruction. And at the end of the first year, my first grade, Mr. Hamburger sent my mother uh, a note for me to take to her. And the note said that Vernon can read uh, the second grade reader as well as the first, so next year he goes into third grade. So that's the way it worked. You moved along, you're, you're in a classroom with uh, the first eight grades, you know, and what's interesting about it is you learn from others so much because you, you, you hear the instruction uh, uh, going on uh, above your grade. And, and, and that just means you move one, one row over if you go from the first to the second, and of course I was being put into the third grade, so I moved three, uh, three, three rows or two rows over. So anyway, that's my uh, early introduction to life in the United States. I know you probably at that young age didn't realize the negative effects of the Great Depression and possibly the, the turnaround in, in the 1930s, if I was going to be correct with saying that. Um, I'm sure it has some kind of parallels with other countries, especially Ireland. If you don't know, you don't realize you're poor because everyone else around you are in, in, are in a similar way or experiencing a similar lifestyle. I think that's that's correct because no, nobody, you know, when we moved back to the city, my father was able to get back on back to work with Bridgeport Machine Company, we moved back to the city. That was very fortuitous because uh, the bank foreclosed on the farm. We weren't able to, there was a, a, a apparently some mortgage on the mark on the farm and we weren't able to meet the payments and lost the farm. So, and that was a very uh, common uh, thing. But we were back in the city and uh, and I uh, and I went and I was in the in the public school system in uh, in in Wichita. But I was very aware of the views toward the depression. And in fact, my mother was a socialist. My mother, and and this is before the farm days. My mother had been a, a admirer of of Eugene Victor Debs. He was the socialist candidate for president on the American Socialist Party in 1920. Well, the, 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 <clears throat> the presidential election was in 1919, but it was, it was going to begin in 1920. So my mother, who is voting for the first time, rem keep in mind the history here, women were not able to vote in the United States until 1919. And my mother has this treasured first-time right to vote, and she votes for Deb. 
Well, what's interesting about that is that Debs was campaigning for the presidency from his prison cell in Atlanta. He had been, had spoken out. He had given an anti-war speech in Ohio a couple of months after the United States had entered the war. And he was very careful not to even mention the first World War I that we were in it. He was very careful not to criticize the president at the time, Woodrow Wilson, and he gave what socialists would call a kind of a generic uh, peace speech. Uh, a speech. Well, he was arrested and uh, and and was in prison. Uh, he polled almost a million votes. In, uh, at, at the time, far more than he had, he had polled before as a socialist candidate. But uh, the high vote in, it tells you how much, what the feelings were about the war. There was a lot of opposition to that war. And now he was freed. Uh, and I, he, he had a 10-year sentence, but he was freed in 19... Uh, 21 by the Republican president because the whole attitude was changing so fast and people were already looking back on the First World War and its carnage and and so the attitude changed so it was kind of a healing act and so he was released from prison and and, and that was a really interesting time you know it's a time of 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 crisis, a lot of tension, a very polarization. Polarization is not unusual in American politics, and 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 you see it there. So anyway, my mother mother was a socialist, and so I was brought up, you see, with uh, 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 with a, a in a family and around uh, people that were. There were several things about them. They, 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 they were tended to be opposed to war. They were opposed to racial discrimination. You see, my mother was uh, very much in favor of equal rights for all races and, and, uh, and ethnicities. And so I was brought up in that, brought, brought up in that. Well... I, I often like to say is the American socialists got two things right. Uh, one, it was they were passionate defenders of freedom of speech. They they were skeptics about war and thought we should do our best to stay out of them. They only got one thing wrong. They didn't really understand economics and how things work. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 162 with Jennifer Burns on Ayn Rand's views on capitalism communism and Christianity, and why the individual is better than the collective, the virtues of selfishness, hippies in the 1960s, objectivism, existentialism, and Nietzsche. So she's writing, you know, in the era of the large, large corporation, when most media, film, magazines, you know, were presenting the sort of the organization man and the corporation as a, a the ultimate um, space of conformity. Like if you were, if you worked for capitalists, you were sort of boring, you were conformist, you weren't that interesting. And Rand comes along with a totally different set of ideas, um, making capitalism seem exciting, daring, risk-taking. Um, and then she put it in a very political context that um, all these great things would be happening except for the government, which is trying to tell you what to do, trying to redistribute, um, not getting what is happening. And, um, you know, that resonated for many people. But then she went even one step further, and this, I think, is both compelling and and but ultimately not convincing for many people. She said that capitalism is fundamentally moral, the sort of individual effort, the expression of individual drive and choice. That is that is a moral thing, and too much morality has been focused on collective needs. Um, and I instead am going to focus on the individual and what makes the individual a moral person is being independent, self reliant, and creative. And it doesn't have to do with your relationships with other people, it more has to do with your relationship to yourself. Are you acting with integrity? Are you following your own ideas? Are you following your own dream? 
So there's a there's a psychological piece to it too that's very powerful for people who read her work. Jennifer, I can only imagine what it was like heading into the 1960s and the 70s with the hippies, because they are more of a group of people who seem who are communal or who like the collective outlook or looking after one another and anti-conformity or anti-establishment, perhaps even, I don't know if I could say anti-capitalist, but, you know, I'm, did they embrace her work or was there a conflict there? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, an interesting moment when Rand gets taken up by um, the early libertarian movement, who she referred to as hippies of the right. Um, she really did not like hippies and she did not like libertarians. And there was a, a kind of countercultural movement on the right and it, it partook of many of the same, you know, things we think about. We think of classic hippies, anti-establishment, um, you know, against the man, um, wanting to be free, wanting to be independent. Um, but instead of focusing on collective um, effort and building communities, these so-called liber- uh, hippies of the right instead saw capitalism as a very powerful force for liberation. And so it's it's really the position on capitalism that ends up separating that student right from student left. Um, and they had some real overlap when it came to the war in Vietnam uh, because, um, you know, Rand uh, opposed the draft and many other libertarians, Friedman opposed the draft. So for students on the right who were um, – uh, opponents of the war or opponents of the draft, they really found something there. There was some common ground, but you really had to like capitalism to, to like Ayn Rand. And, you know, that was, that kind of became a dividing line. Um, but there was that, that, that sort of sixties energy and that rebellion against all that was supposed to be good and true and right. Um, Rand got caught up in that as well because she really was an iconoclast. And what is an iconoclast? Well, I mean, in terms of uh, she was she was not afraid to say um, that things should be radically different. And a lot of um, she arrayed a lot of her anger or her, her critique against Christianity. And, and that really becomes another point of tension. I mean, that was what Whitaker Chambers um, struggled with. And that was what conservatives in general, you know, they were like, oh, her, her ideas about capitalism are interested. And, you know, she's a free marketer and a free trader. But boy, she's an atheist. Um, and she's not quiet about it. You know, she wasn't like, OK, I'm an atheist. You're a Christian. Fine. We can work together. She, no. If you um, accepted her ideas about capitalism, she thought you had to buy the whole thing, including what she called the morality of selfishness, which, you know, she had constructed um, in opposition to what she thought was traditional Christian morality. So <clears throat> I can get here's that. someone. Yeah. Here's someone coming and saying, you know, thousands of years of um, religious and ethical traditions are completely wrong, need to be completely reassembled. And here's my new system that I've built. And, you know, you better get on board or not. So so in terms of being a smasher of idols, absolutely. Like her her secular outlook on these type of issues might have could have drawn a a very much a, a large divide, as we noticed with your reference to Whitaker. Um, but over time, even thousands of years ago, people have always worshipped gods and there's always this religious dogma, perhaps um, the spread of Christianity eventually. Or, you know, if we see Norse mythology and Roman Roman gods and Greek gods, it's always part of not all of our type of thinking, philosophical thinking, but it's always been there. But uh, I can't speak for every culture or every country either. But fundamentally, she could be, you know, I can see where the the sense is about looking at the moral issue from a self-interested point of view. Mm -hmm. Because we haven't even touched on the word objectivism. But when I read some of this stuff on Ayn Rand there recently, it was a book I always intended to get and I never get it, got it and I will, will definitely go and purchase it. Uh, but it sounded like another philosophical thinking that I've read about, which was ex- existentialism. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. And existentialism is also a very associated with that same time period. So to really understand what Rand is doing on the, in the sort of macro scale, you have to know that she was born in Russia she witnessed the Russian Revolution. Her family was dispossessed. 
It was a bourgeois middle class Jewish family, um, always secular. And um, so she identified um, ethnically as a, a Jewish woman, although in America, she really that was a very um, small part of her public identity. But in Russia at the time, it was very clear um, that uh, Russian Jews lived in their own social space. So she's part of that highly educated, highly acculturated, highly secularized um, middle class, prosperous family lost her property. And then um, the family basically struggled from there on to survive. And this is like my favorite fact about Rand. She got a degree from the University of Leningrad. So she literally had a, a degree in communism, essentially. She's really tutored in the essentials of the Soviet system, propaganda, um, what it all meant. And she hated it. And she basically felt that at the root of everything that had happened, all the tragedy that had befallen her family, everything that was happening in Russian society was the idea that the collective was more important than the individual. And so she basically thought, if I can create a system where the individual is the, the, the unit of value, then something like communism will never be able to happen. And she saw Christianity as part of the problem because it tutored people in being selfless and thinking about the other person. And she really accepted uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's critique of Christianity as a slave morality. Mm. And she wanted to instead to focus on the individual and, and build up the individual. So that's this very big and deep philosophical program that she then brings to the United States and translates into fiction. And, you know, she did it Never first move. with the... I mean, it, it really was. And, and people wonder, like, how she did all of this. Well, you know, she worked in the movie industry for quite some time and she was just methodical. I mean, she had a notebook with over 300 films that she had seen and she would take very detailed notes on the plot um, and what she thought of it. So she studied really hard at how to make an accessible um, narrative. And then she thought about how to implant it with philosophical and political ideas, which she also had been exposed to in Soviet Russia. So her whole life was really training and practice for producing the kind of work she did. Episode 147 with Nayo Hata on Eleanor Ostrom's work on collective action and cooperation to reach mutually beneficial outcomes and how this can relate to natural resource problems, as well as Ostrom's observation of reciprocity in game theory. The case for private ownership is that they might have certain systems, legal systems, or ways of isolating that area so that pollution may not occur. And is this something that you might come across in your research? Or have you come across it in, in certain areas that private ownership may be better than public ownership of these types of parks and lands and waters? Right, so... You're definitely on the right track in terms of, you know, Hardin's tragedy of the commons. And uh, so Hardin uh, kind of in in that work, in the tragedy of the commons, where, you know, he talks about people, no one in particular owning a resource and, and everybody kind of racing to degrade it because they're sort of acting in their own self-interest. And, and so Hardin put forth or he believed that people couldn't really cooperate that was kind of the underlying theme is that that people don't cooperate and they act in self-interest. And that's why you need this private property and property rights. And yeah, I mean, you do, property rights are, are important. But what Ostrom talked about was that people do people do cooperate. She found all these examples. And, and you're exactly right that it started from game theory. She noticed uh, in observing these uh, these games involving two people that people would cooperate in circumstances where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to. You'd, you'd think that rationally they would act out of self-interest. And But she started to get curious about this because she saw reciprocity. And reciprocity rests on trust, right? You have to trust that the other person is going to return the, you know, the goodwill that you extended to them. And so that's kind of where where the starting point is for this work is that, okay, so... Under what conditions do people effectively work together when they have property rights, but those property rights are shared among a group of people or two different groups of pre people that are working together? So in in my particular research, I'm looking at uh, trust between First Nations, so uh, groups of Indigenous peoples in Canada, 
and the provincial or federal governments uh, when they work together uh, and share decisions about natural resources, whether it's parks or fisheries or forests. And yeah, so how do you create those rules uh, under which people are willing to work together? And, and, you know, at that point, my research sort of uh, encompasses more than, so from, if you look at it strictly from an economic perspective and, and a game theory perspective, you have in these experimental games two people that know very little about one another. They are so their decisions are essentially reduced to calculative decisions about the cost and benefit. But then, you know, outside of an experimental setting where you have groups of people that interact on a regular basis, there are so many more factors that influence those that decision to trust. And so this research is drawing broadly on sociology, psychology, organizational behavior, what's known about trust from all those different fields, including economics, but where people, where we recognize that people um, in a real world setting are making decisions based on, you know, their knowledge of somebody else's expertise, uh, their emotions toward those people, perceived integrity, uh, as well as their own individual propensity to trust based on their kind of lived experience. So it's it's a huge <laughs> research topic, um, it is, yeah. but it's very it's very interesting and uh, and I think it'll really contribute quite a bit to the field of new institutional economics because you know collective action theory that sort of stuff has been a bit neglected ever since uh, Ostrom passed away. You know, in her Nobel Prize lecture, she talked a lot about trust and, and the future research that she wanted to see in this area. But people people have kind of neglected the field in many ways since she passed away. And, and I'm hoping I've been hearing more about, you know, collective action and institutional ex- economics over the over the past few years, particularly with all the, you know, the conflict and uh, and sort of acrimony in the political sphere that I'm I'm hoping that's stimulating more interest in uh, in cooperation and collective action. Another thing I want, going back to Eleanor Ostrom's research, I wonder, does she take into consideration the powerful lobbyist groups or would they, would they have been as present? Would they have as, as much political strength at the time when she wrote her paper and received the Nobel Prize or did she give a full warning as to this type of, these groups that are, that could hinder this type of um, reciprocity and collective collaboration, I suppose, and coming up with a, a good solution for the environment. That's a great question. Yeah, um, I you know, and I haven't come across references to that kind of issue in her in her work in her papers. I think she was mostly focused on, but she does talk about in one of her papers where she has a, a sort of a conceptual model. She does talk about like context, right? The systems context that acts on these people who are making these decisions. And I think that's kind of where this whole range of other things that are um, acting on these people. So it can be political, it can be historical, legal, uh, it can be lobbying. Uh, There's a whole set of sort of external conditions that can can put pressure on the people who are collaborating. And, and that's, you know, that's a very relevant point in the context of relations between First Nations and federal or provincial governments in Canada is sort of that, that history of colonialism and, and distrust that's created as a result of that. So, um, you know, we, we have sort of a, a dark history of residential schools, um, taking First Nations children away from their families, mm assimilationist policy, not allowing people to practice their culture. So all those things. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, another way that um, the systems context can really affect these collaborative institutions and, and whether trust can be created. But you're absolutely right. There's a whole set of, of different things that can, can act on those institutions. Episode 135 with David Zetland on group cooperation on protecting public goods, such as the water supply and the environment, and how cooperation rewards and benefits groups. You have, uh, again, another paper uh, that you published in last year in 2017, exploring group cooperation and the provision of public goods. And you did mention uh, water being public goods, and you actually touched on it in your previous paper, the evolution of Dutch drinking water. Yeah. 
you know, you, you mentioned that it's a novel version of a voluntary contribution mechanism. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> that's exactly what, what does it mean <laughs> before you start creating acronyms of VZM or whatever or a Vol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All this uh, jargon. Luckily, yeah. that paper was uh, – I, I wrote a, a two-page summary for a, a newsletter for that paper. But uh, that paper was – you know, here's the most interesting thing about the paper is that I, I did the, the original data collection in 2007. Okay. So, you know, you talk about a long shelf life of, of, of data. So there was a special issue and a call for papers about about strategic behavior in the environment. So this paper is a, uh, the experiments I did, which were on computers in a laboratory with students. Yeah. In, in, in the experiments, the students were in groups. They were in, uh, you know, computer anonymous groups. And the voluntary contribution mechanism is a, another word for a public goods game. So what that meant is that if you're in a group of with three other people, you don't know who they are. You're in the room, but you don't who, don't know who's in your group. What that means is that if you put your 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 game tokens in, into the public good, then you benefit, but also everybody else benefits. Mm. And if you and other people put in their their tokens, then you benefit from those contributions. So it's a voluntary contribution. The 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 trouble is that. If you don't put any in, then you you benefit from their contributions. So you can free ride on what they're doing. Mm. And and this is a challenge in any 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 government, any country, any community in the world is who's going to pay for a public good. And like you do these podcasts, right? Mm. If you didn't do it, who would do it, right? Because you're putting in all your time and effort. And if you say uh, I'm doing this, then people get to enjoy it for free. And if you say I'm not going to do it, then there's no more podcasts from Frank. So public goods have a problem of not being provided at, at high enough levels compared to where people want them. And the question is, how do we get people to cooperate more so that everybody puts in some tokens? So that's the fundamental question. And the paper was ex- exploring different ways of getting people to cooperate to contribute to these public goods. So the baseline situation was you can free ride, or you can cooperate, and you get paid according to how much money you have in your pocket based on the public good uh, distribution, but also what you keep in your pocket, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're a free rider, you do, be- you, do, you, you do better all the time. But if everybody else sees that you're free riding, then they start to take down their contributions also, mm-hmm. and then everybody's worse off. Mm-hmm. So what you want everybody to do is to cooperate so that everybody benefits. Okay. And, and that's what happens when you have, you know, imagine you have, you have a sports team. This is a much easier analogy, right? If you have a sports team, a football team, Everybody goes to practice. Everybody uh, sleeps well. Nobody gets drunk before the game. Everybody goes to the game. They give it their all. They work as a team, et cetera. They're, they're much more likely to beat the opposition team compared to no practice, drunk, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. So if your teammates are free riding and they just show up and they don't do their work, everybody else is like, hey, you're not even being a good player on the team. Mm-hmm. So this is a kind of a team question. And – in, so once I set up that basic thing, I, I created a, a couple different treatments to try and see if I could get more cooperation out of people. And the main finding, which is pretty obvious, especially just since I talked about sports, is that if you if you make people's payments depend on how well they do, not compared to people in their own team, but compared to people who are not in their team, then you create this kind of we should we should be a team and beat them dynamic. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the cooperation in the team, even though there's an incentive to free ride, it rises because you're trying to beat the other teams. And and likewise, or to the contrary, what I said is if all that matters is that you beat people in your team and it doesn't matter about people who are in the other teams, then everybody starts to hate on each other because they're trying to beat people in their same team. So I was trying to create conditions where people will be less cooperative and more cooperative. And surprise, surprise, when you when you have them in teams trying to beat the other teams, they they cooperate more with each other. And the thing that's interesting is because everybody is in these different teams trying to cooperate is that all the cooperation goes up. Mm. Right. Compared to the baseline where there wasn't this team you were trying to beat. Yeah. So if you think about it, if you have a sports league, uh, sorry, a sports team and you're just playing pickup football, then you come out, you you, you play, you might go get drunk, whatever. But as soon as you join a league and everybody's like, we have to beat the other people in the other teams, then they, people get a lot more serious about practice and being in shape and so on. And, and I use this, I didn't use this analogy, but I use the analogy of bureaucrats working for different uh, 
divisions. So you have bureaucrats that are in charge in of inspecting restaurants. Mm. You have bureaucrats in charge of uh, traffic flow. You have bureaucrats in charge of tax collection, whatever. If you make a competition so that the bureaucrats that do better at tax collection, they get a reward because they did better than the other bureaucrats that are doing, I said taxes, the bureaucrats that are giving out parking tickets, then what happens is the bureaucrats may start to cooperate more with each other because they're just trying to beat the guys in the office across the yeah. across town, right? Because yeah. bureaucrats are hard to motivate. If they're in the office at all, they might not pick up the phone. If they're picking up the phone, it's from somebody for somebody else in the office. Maybe they don't care. They don't take <laughs> Right. There is a thing you bet you work in a school, right? You've heard about these issues, right? Like you go to the copy machine. There's no paper in the copy machine. Right. So uh, who's whose job is this? Right. Yeah. So if you can build more cooperation inside of a of a, a unit, then every unit is going to be better off. And as a, the whole the whole university or the whole city or the whole government will be better off because these bureaucrats are kind of being rewarded for mm. working together better as a team. So that was really the point of that paper. Yeah. It's, that's an interesting paper. You know, it kind of touches on not Nash equilibrium, but it does touch on the kind of game theory aspect of economics. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Episode 168 with Harry Markovitz on growing up at the family grocery store during the Great Depression in an upper middle class area, using the museums and libraries of Chicago as a teen. Darwin's origin of species as an influence and how reading the great philosophers and his self-study of the physical sciences helped him with his placement at the University of Chicago. If you could take us back to your formative years, your younger life, you were born in 1927, so you just yes. born just prior to the Great Depression. Uh, August 24th, 1927. Now, my folks owned a grocery store. So we always ate well. Now, sometimes if there was leftover green beans, uh, mother would make up a big batch of green beans with onions and potatoes. Uh, and next door was a, uh, in fact, there was an opening you could uh, walk through from, uh, eventually from my father's house to, uh, I'm sorry, from my, my father's store, his grocery store to the meat market next door. And then there was a screen that could be pulled cross it if one was open the other wasn't so we ate well i i was an only child i think mother had problems with childbirth so uh, i really and i read i always had enough you know money to buy books uh and listen to music so as far as i was concerned personally i sort of missed the i i didn't realize there was a great depression is that because everybody was in the same boat in terms of how they were affected by it or was it that no, you were no, well protected they, from it? You have to visualize uh, I'm in a upper middle class or middle class to upper middle class neighborhood. Everybody in that neighborhood owned their own homes. Uh, some of them may have been having problems, but I never saw them. My father owned a grocery store. Everybody that came in the oak grocery store was well dressed, uh, you know, for for schlepping around the neighborhood, for just lucky around the neighborhood. And as far as I was concerned, there never was a depression. Okay. So it was it was a, a neighborhood, or would you think people had self pride that they didn't want to reveal the effects of the Great Depression they had on their lives, or? Was it just the area? Uh, at the maximum, there was, uh, you know, now first, 1927, uh, I was a child. Uh, by 1939, I would have been 12 years old. So I was uh, a, a, a child. I was living in a neighborhood where everybody had owned their own house, homes or had were duplexes. Uh, the people who came into my father's grocery stores uh, was, was you know, let's suppose that at the heart there was, what, 10, 12 percent unemployment, but not where I lived. When you said you had a lot of books that you read, what would have draw your, drawn your interest or who would have drawn your interest to what well, so topics? I became a reader early in life. At the age of about 14, I uh, I just happened to read uh, Darwin's Origin of Species, and I was just absolutely fascinated by uh, 
the way he marshaled his evidence. If you've never read it, you, it's really a very systematic account of, you know, putting your, <laughs> stating your hypothesis and putting your evidence together and so on. Very impressive. I, uh, from then on, I read, uh, 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 well, I read science at a popular level, like the ABC of relativity, but I, I read philosophy. Um, you know, um, I read Aristotle, Plato, uh, Hume was my favorite, you know, uh, also um, Descartes, what do we know and how do we know it, I think, therefore I am, uh, that kind of stuff. I lived nine miles from downtown Chicago, so I would uh, walk, you know, on a, a weekday in the summer when I wasn't, you know, helping dad in the grocery store when I began working in the grocery store Saturdays. And uh, so I would walk to downtown. There were these stands with great Chicago hot dogs and Chicago uh, tomatoes and stuff like that. So I have two or three hot, uh, hot dogs or maybe four hot dogs in the course of nine miles. And then I would, uh, th- there was a, there were bookstores, used bookstores you could get for 50 cents or a dollar of, you know, origin of spe- uh, well, uh, I'm thinking of uh, Kant's a Critique of Pure Reason or Hume's uh, Inquiry into this or that. And then uh, there were um, Art Institute, uh, the Field Museum, the Shedd Aquarium, the, the Planetarium, Adler Planetarium. And then what drove, drove me down was the outdoor concerts, the Saturday concerts, and then going back, I'd ride the streetcar. It was idyllic. For a, for, for a nerd, it was just an idyllic setting. And this is something that you were well exposed to or you were well aware of, so you were drawn to all this type of life, whereas perhaps other people may have not seen what you had seen and gone down a different route altogether. Yes, everybody, it's it's uh, environment and uh, <laughs> your genes, and there's a phrase I'm, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm blocking. But, for example, uh, my closest uh, I was what we call a nerd now. My closest friends were a um, another nerd who became a uh, professor of chemistry and and retired when he was 65 at a re- you know at a sensible age and now lives still alive ex- and lives in uh, um, back east and in, in, you know in the Boston area. And I'm a, I came to California, state became a Californian. So he and I still uh, correspond. My, I had a girlfriend uh, who became my first wife, um, and she's no longer with. You know, she's uh, with a. We divorced, and b. She's she also is now deceased. So uh, other people, you know, in that same neighborhood, Conrad Jankowski and me were the only ones that, and Luella Johnson went in one direction, and everybody else went in another direction. And it was a time when you hit your twenties. Would you have been pressurized to enlist into the army in the United States, well, or was academic was, life? I was. Uh, I became became eighteen towards the end of the war. Uh, I was born August twenty fourth, nineteen twenty seven. You can figure out mm-hmm. whether uh, I think VE Day had already happened and VJ had not. I had a small uh, what's called a polynidal cyst, which was removed. Later, uh, in an office, a little outpatient surgery, so there was no big deal to have removed it. If you, but they were at a point in time where they could see they were about to discharge people instead of enlist people, mm-hmm. and having a, being not quite uh, right, they said I was four F. So if I had been drafted, I would have, you know, been, been. I probably, since my hobby was cryptography, I probably would have ended up in cryptography instead of uh, infantry. But uh, that's an alternate life that one could only conjecture about. That's true. And you were actually into cryptography at the time. Do you think that would have set you up for your love of mathematics and problem solving? No, I think it's a sub- symptom. Uh, 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 the fact that I read Darwin's Origin of Species and and was just absolutely enamored of uh, Hume and uh, Descartes and still am. I, I'm writing a four volume book. Uh, I suppose we'll mention eventually. Yes. Volume one was a uh, single period, uh, you know, decision under un- risk and uncertainty. Volume one, single period, known odds. 
uh, volume two. These are in print. Well, volume one and volume two are in print called Risk and Return and uh, the Theory and Practice of Rational Investing, but it really means rational decision making. Hey, volume two, uh, many period known odds. And volume three is the uncertainty case. And we get into the philosophers and so on. What do we know and how do we know? And volume four will be applications. Um, but uh, I, I, did I wander off from your question? Probably did. No, Harry. You know, with all this love of philosophy and cryptography, why economics? What happened? Uh, that's that's a great question. <laughs> I went to the University of, of Chicago, and it turned – well, my grades were not super great because, for example – in algebra, if the algebra, if the teacher assigned us 30 problems, you know, the first 29 were boring. Uh, I, she would say, uh, Miss, I remember Mrs. McGrady said, oh, Harry, if you could just do your homework, I could give you an A. You get 100 on your test, but you don't turn in your homework. Well, the first uh, 29 were just doing the same thing over and over again and with different words. And the 30th would be hard, and all the A students would come to me and say, how do I solve this? And I'd solve it for him. So I was uh, somehow tedium has never been, uh, tedium is the enemy. Uh, the uh, Okay, so when I went to the University of Chicago, I said, my grades are not super, but I read all these philosophers and I read science at a popular level like the ABC of Relativity. I said, and they said, well, we usually don't take people in uh, who are at your level of in high school, but we'll let you take the entrance exam. Well, it turns out that the entrance exam was not only a uh, can you get in, but it was a placement exam. How much have you already? Kn- how much already do you already know about certain fields? Well, it turned out that my popular reading, I, I had learned on my own as much of the physical sciences as they were going to teach. Uh, teach the other. So they said, you you don't have to take the survey course on uh, the physical sciences. So I took, I, so, but I did take the, the the survey course on the social sciences, including uh, economics. The, the uh, At that time, the Hutchins-Adler uh, program was, was one of uh, uh, everybody should learn, uh, you know, the social sciences, the physical sciences, the humanities, and so on and so forth. And so I took these, sur- and they taught these survey courses uh, over two years. You got a PhD, uh, Bachelor of Philosophy. Uh, anyway, so when I uh, I took an economics course in my uh, survey of the social sciences, and I was uh, it was very uh, it fascinated the combination of mathematics and empiricism fascinated me. And so when I graduated, and I had to go into pick a division, upper division, I forgot about my love of the physical sciences, especially what's now called cosmology. And I went, I just went into the economics department. The rest was history. Exactly. Yeah. And we know that history because in 1952, you wrote a paper on utility, on portfolio selection. Yes, and you're about to say uh, uh, 1952 is a good year for me. I wrote, I wrote three papers, uh, co- co-wrote one. One was called Portfolio Selection, and that's my famous one. A second one was called Utility of Wealth, and it's the paper which uh, Kahneman Tversky read when they formulated their prospect theory. And uh, if you read Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, the actual relation, the moment they said, oh, yes, uh, Markowitz's old 1952, then 25-year-old paper has the key to explaining their experiments. And then uh, uh, basically it said uh, uh, what Kahneman got out of my paper was if you're trying to to explain behavior, don't put utility to wealth put utility to change in wealth, and it has a certain shape and so on. And then there was a paper that I co-wrote with Leo Goodman. I did most of the work, but we put our uh, names alphabetically, Goodman and Markowitz, on Arrow's, uh, Ken Arrow's paradox. And it's, it's that's still in use. It's still quoted. All these are still quoted. Episode 125 with Eugene Fama on his early academic year to the development of the efficient market hypothesis as well as the Benoit Mandelbrot's discovery of Louis Bachelier's paper.
just have an idea of what life was like growing up compared to today in academia, perhaps, or whether your formative years in your household had an influence on how you decided to take the path into economics? Uh, uh, well, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to college. So I was a third generation Italian and none of the previous two generations had gone to college. Uh, so I was the first to one to do that. And when I went to Tufts, <clears throat> I thought I would study Romance languages and eventually be a high school teacher and a sports coach. Uh, but I got kind of bored with that and I took an economics course in my junior year in college and loved it and switched to economics thereafter. And then I went off to Chicago after I graduated from uh, Tufts. And was the fact that you're an Italian made you choose something uh, on the romanticism side before <laughs> you, um, or is that just a stereotype? <laughs> Uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think it had anything to do with it, actually, but it certainly had nothing to do with me eventually choosing economics. No. <laughs> and and it Italian wasn't one of the languages I was studying anyway. <laughs> but uh, Italians are stereotypical romanticists, I think, based on the works <laughs> of the Renaissance artists and <laughs> the good looks that they have as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to find out how, as a, an academic then, as a student, what it was like in terms of the approach to economics compared to today? I know in terms of the mathematical sense, it was pretty much in its infancy. And you were at the forefront of that with Paul Samuelson and in that time period. Well, uh, no, I'm, I, I'm not a mathematical person, so I would have had trouble getting through today's PhD programs. I'm more of a statistical kind of uh a person, if you look at the theory papers that I've written, they're all very basic and there's never much uh, math in them. So I never took any math courses and it's all basically self-taught. Uh, so I'm uh, really an intuitive kind of economist and most of my work is empirical. And is the rigor that you had undergone in terms of the level of academic rigor, would you have noticed any fundamental changes in the approach taken in your years as a student compared to how you taught or how you teach in Chicago today to these well, present-day students? It, economics has exploded since then. There was The courses were very thin in, the, in those days. This is the, uh, the early 60s where we're talking about uh, the courses were were very thin, and the research that was being done was it would look really primitive by by today's uh, standards. And basically, every area has uh, exploded in terms of theory and empirical work in, in the ensuing fifty plus plus years. So the world looks much different today than it than it did did then. For example, uh, most of my work is in finance and. Really, academic finance didn't exist no. uh, when I started. There were no, there were no courses worth taking uh, in finance in, in those days. I took most of my work in, in economics. The finance courses were really a joke. Uh, it, it took the basically the late 60s and 70s were a time when finance exploded both in terms of theory and related empirical work to become in my view, the most successful area of economics. Uh, but none of that existed back then. Yeah. And that's true in other areas. So if you look at, for example, microeconomics, it was a dead area for a long time until Gary Becker and others came along and got them thinking in different ways. And then that area exploded both in terms of theory and empirical work to be, you know, the really... Most people are, so many people coming out these days in economics tend to be applied micro people. And I suppose not since the time, the classical economists, perhaps we haven't seen such an explosion in economics as you mentioned there. I suppose the 1950s and 60s onwards has given us a lot of different types of approaches to understanding economics and to apply them to the real world. And you have the likes of and von, you know, Keynes in the 20s and von Hayek and 
than Milton Friedman right. and right. Well, those people those people all made important contributions, but they were kind of unique in their era. I think you don't there aren't that there isn't that much from early economics that that made a big impact, a big lasting impact. That infamous dissertation that you worked on in the 1960s, uh -huh. right. you were a young economist, a young academic. Did you know what was going to be ahead of you when you were starting out or how your dissertation evolved on the efficient market hypothesis? Were you aware of how much of a contribution this was going to be to the finance and economics discipline? Well, I think all of us working in the area at that time thought it was a big deal, but I, I think researchers always think their stuff is a big deal. So <laughs> this, this, this happened to work out uh, quite well. But, you know, that was a new, unique period in, in the sense that computers were just coming around. So people were able to do empirical work that they couldn't do uh, before without having a large number of uh, research assistants who may do it right or who may do it into the data incorrectly. Uh, and that kind of freed up empirical people to do work that they weren't able to do before. And that was uh, in finance, you know, there's lots of available data that could be used in empirical work. So finance was one of the first areas that really took advantage of computers. And I was luck, <clears throat> lucky to be there in the beginning. When you were doing your work on the efficient market hypothesis, Paul Simonson came across a paper by Louis Bichelier. Were you aware of that paper at that particular point in time, or was it? Uh, I don't think it was Samuelson. I, I think it was... Um, Kutner, was it? No, no, Benoit, ben, Benoit Mandelbro. Oh, uh, he, was, he, he was the one that made me aware of it. He was French, of course, yes. and he was aware of uh, Bachelier's work. Now, I don't know, maybe he got it from Samuelson, but I'm, I don't think so. I think he was the one that discovered it, because he would have been able to read it. It was never translated. Until until uh, Paul Kutner had it translated. That makes sense, actually, that Mandelbrot would have uh, discovered that paper or brought it to the attention to the academic world. Uh, I think I think he came across it as during his own graduate days in France. And was that uh, such a pivotal point in how we would look at stock markets back then? Uh, I, I don't know if you read Bachelier's paper whether you would have extracted that message from it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, after the fact, there's always stuff that looks like it had the idea before whoever gets credit for it had it. But then you would look back and say, well, if I hadn't read other people's stuff, would I really have read Bachelier that way? Mm. And I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think it is. Episode 167 with James Kenneth Galbraith on the influences of his father, John, on his own academic work in economics and the significance or lack of significance of economics in academia today. Thank you. Good to be with you. I'm very blessed to have you and looking forward to um, talking to you about you and your work. And I suppose, uh, if you don't mind, we get cracking on your background on how you actually found economics, because I know you have a, a nice lineage there. And is this an influence that your father had brought to you, or did you discover it in other ways? Oh, it was a, an act of teenage rebellion, naturally, because my father was one of the great uh, economic uh, dissidents of his era. So I decided I would have to actually study the subject. And when I did, I discovered he was right. So the rebellion fizzled. But there, then I, at that point, I was stuck in the profession. Because I can imagine any young kid growing up and they're under pressure from a, f a father or mother who are highly intelligent in terms of a medical profession or in science. And they'd like to pass on that type of knowledge or encourage no, no, the kid no, not, to go the not, right not way. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, they... My father, first of all, you, you have to bear in mind that he grew up on a farm. Yeah. Uh, and so his general view was that anything that did not involve uh, steering a plow and staring at the back of a team of horses was improvement. Uh, but beyond that, he was also, uh, as he uh, developed his career and reputation, acutely aware of the power hi hierarchies and uh, that uh, the true power in American society rests with lawyers rather than economists. So he was quite pleased when my oldest brother became a lawyer, but 
the rest of us, the two younger ones, Peter and myself, who followed in his footsteps as a diplomat and an economist, he thought, well, OK, that's that's acceptable at, at some <laughs> level, but it is not certainly the, the, the best thing one could have done. Oh, my God. Wow. Um, because I and you you read about his work earlier on, and you found out that he was somewhat a dissident to the mainstream economists out there. This was obvious from the time I was very small. But, was it? But, oh, sure. I mean, in the sense that that the, that when I was six years old, he published the Affluent Society, yeah. which uh, remains one of the uh, perhaps the leading. Uh, a critique of the uh, of the mainstream economics of the age, and uh, and that book is dedicated to me. So I'm I'm stuck with the uh, with the association from from a very early age. Yeah, uh, just to be even to be tuned in at that early age of what was going on with. Um... Well, I'm not going to say that at six years old I was aware of this, but you know, it's a it's the milieu you grew up in. And that must have been very difficult to be as you grew as you got older to be aware of. The criticisms, perhaps, that your father was um, exposed to, but also the support that he had garnered, especially when he worked for the, the presidents, a number of presidents. So now, he was it, doing, it, definitely doing things right. Let's, yeah, let's be honest. It wasn't difficult at all. Uh, I had a, an, an opportunity growing up to be, uh, uh, you know, in the center of a great many interesting things. Uh, and some dramatic things, including the opposition to the war in Vietnam, which really did his leadership of that movement in the 1960s was a defining part of my adolescence. Uh, but no, I mean, they, they, I, 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 I can't uh, state for a second that there were difficulties associated with this. It was all in the in the realm of of of, of really high privileges and and great advantages, which I try to take it you know to to uh, uh, to live up to, but that's <laughs> to say that it was difficulties would be the opposite of the truth. People who who have to start from scratch, who have to make their way up from uh, from from uh, you know as my father did from essentially humble origins, they face difficulties. People like me, no. Yeah. And what what was it like growing up? You you weren't in that farming community any longer than. No, no, no. My father uh, was uh, came to. Harvard University in 1934 and returned as a essentially as a tenured professor in the late 1940s. So that was all before I was born. I grew up in an academic household in a, in in Cambridge, Massachusetts, at the peak, at the peak of its prestige. By the way, as the center of the of the uh, of, of of the intellectual life of the United States. So your formative years would have been based on your you know. As you said, when you were a teenager, you became a bit of a dissident and read your father's work and then realized actually he or a rebe rebellious in a way. And you read his work and you found out that he was actually correct. So those formative years were exposed you to economic yeah, argument I, and independent I thinking. I don't want to get into the rebellion stuff too much. I said that somewhat facetiously. Yeah. No, no, we were all very uh very proud of my father's role, both as an economist and as a uh, leader of the opposition to the war in Vietnam, which was the great social movement, political movement of my adolescence. So mm. there was no point at which I was in, uh, uh, in real rebellion. But I did say facetiously that uh, uh, that uh, actually going at you know at the age of uh, in my early twenties to uh, to to study. Economics at the graduate level uh, to take a PhD in the subject uh, did require that I spend a, a, a few years, or at least in any way, a few months absorbing the mainstream orthodoxies to which my father was had already offered the dominant critique. So the, the, there was, I won't say that I was ever attracted to those orthodoxies, uh, mm -hmm. but I did realize that I had to pass, I had to pass muster in that those circles before I could be uh, take on the, the mantle of a, of a professional economist economist myself. And do you think it's important for economists to help nurture and mature their thinking? Is it important to read this work by other economists, especially the mainstream? Uh, I discourage students from taking advanced degrees in economics at this juncture in the life of the discipline, because in my view, there really has not been any significant 
or interesting intellectual development, anything really is worth the time uh, over the since the maybe late 1970s, early 1980s at the at the latest. Uh, and so it, it, we're looking at a discipline which is uh, at the mainstream level, largely stagnant, uh, hermetically sealed upon itself a set of of scholastic exercises. Very few members of the profession uh, have any useful role in, in public policy, certainly in the United States or in Europe, uh, other than uh, they get positions at, in you know, advisory bodies like or central banks and things of that nature. But they're not really playing a, a uh, contributing to the let's say, to the governance of the country in any significant or constructive way. So my, my, my view at the moment is that, that the economics profession needs a very radical uh, makeover reform or uh, more essentially that it should be de-emphasized by universities so that uh, more useful and productive fields can, be, uh, can come to the fore. So what next for the economics discipline then in academia? Well, it's you know they, they, we we have uh, around the world in various places monasteries that continue to harbor monks uh, and that have uh, traditions that have not changed since the Middle Ages uh, and economics uh, academic economics is by way of becoming a very similar phenomenon. Uh, a, a group of, of, of self-involved people hold up on a on an isolated mountain and, and, and cut off out of con- out of contact with the rest of the world. The only difference difference there is that the that the monasteries tend to cultivate uh, important artistic achievements, uh, or else they continue to make very good brandy. Uh, and I don't see either of those things in the uh, in, in developing out of academic economics. So if we have to continue teaching economics or even reading or studying economics, um, we are going about it the wrong way in terms of what's being taught. Because say, for example, uh, I, I know personally that we're quite restrictive in terms of the curriculum and it's mostly Keynesian or you get the, some monetarist uh, economic thinking as well. There's very little Keynes. You cannot find Keynes on a on on a a uh, graduate level curriculum, I would think practically anywhere uh, in certainly in the United States. And I would be surprised in Europe other than in a handful of uh, courses of a handful of people who have uh, who are distinctly on the fringe of the discipline. Keynes, who was the dominant uh, theoretical economist of the mid 20th century, has been practically read out of the uh, uh, of the curriculum. There are the word Keynesian is still used. Uh, but it is a faint and highly uh, unrepresentative, distorted picture of Keynes himself, and it completely bleeds out the important critique that Keynes made of the of the thinking of his time. Uh, and uh, so, the, I I would uh, really take exception to the idea that Ke- that Keynes's ideas uh, remain uh, Im- uh, importantly represented. One of the problems is that precisely that they don't. Uh, and one could go and look at the other significant uh, innovative figures of the past two centuries, and you will find the same phenomenon. There's no good representation of Marx, or for that matter, of Schumpeter. Uh, and I could go give you a list of others who, who should be in the curriculum and who by and large are not. Episode 136 with Abby Hall on the growth of big government since 9-11 and the militarization of the domestic police force in the U.S. from the creation of the first U.S. SWAT team joining the U.S. occupation of the Philippines in 1898. I recall back in, when September 11 happened, the government seemed to grow under say, George Bush uh, by implementing new laws to be able to take action and perhaps uh, do a search at airports and also to try and track uh, people or individuals' whereabouts in terms of their destinations and that. And people are citizens of America or any other country who fear that type of uh, terrorism do, would actually be willing to perhaps give up some part of their civil liberty in order to protect themselves domestically or the, the country from an attack. And I, I think that's the mindset that people have kind of acclimatized to. Uh, I know there are, uh, that's not, broadly speaking, there are groups that would prefer that not to happen in order to protect their privacy. Um, I suppose we see what's going on now with 
uh, Facebook at the moment. Um, there seems to be a lot of privacy that seems to be a bit, uh, like the data protection gone onto a new level in terms of being able to share all that third party information with other companies. I think people certainly do have concerns. And I'm glad you brought up this supposed trade off between liberty and safety, because you hear that a lot. And I know in the United States, it's not even still, it's not uncommon to hear things like, well, I don't care if the TSA searches my stuff, because I have nothing to hide. There's this perceive there's this perception that in order for us to gain more security, we have to give up our liberties. And that frankly, is not accurate, especially if we're talking about something like terrorism. And and again, I'll use the TSA as an example. It's an organization that fails 95% of its own exams. I wish that I could fail at my job 95% of the time and continue to get (laughs) budgetary increases. You have an organization that again, just can, it, it continues to grow. It has yet to catch a single terrorist the people who have tried to engage in acts of terror on airplanes were not, since 9-11 I'm talking about, were not caught by the TSA. They were caught by passengers on the plane. So you have the now infamous underwear bomber and the shoe bomber. These were people who got past TSA. And so what what does that tell you? You're not gaining any more, you do not appear to be gaining any more security, and yet you're giving up. You're giving up your liberty. And one of the things that we are really trying to point out in this new book, especially, is that even when we're looking at policies which don't appear to be have, have any kind of domestic focus or domestic component to them at all, you can still see very real and very nefarious domestic consequences. And what way? So what what we do in the book is we we develop what we refer to as the boomerang effect of foreign intervention. So like we we refer to the uh, foreign policy, and again, we focus on the U.S., but our framework is more generalizable. We look at how foreign intervention can wind up impacting domestic liberties. And so typically when we talk about or when the public or policymakers talk about foreign policy, again, they tend to do so with some pretty terrible assumptions. There's this idea that foreign policy happens in a vacuum, that it is distinct and completely separated from domestic outcomes. So you have domestic policy, that's here. You have foreign policy, that's over there, wherever there happens to be. And there's no, uh, there's no crossover between them. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't think there would be. You, you think that because they're applying a certain foreign policy, that there are two different policies in terms of domestic and foreign. But as you mentioned there, you're going to explain is that they're qu- quite linked and interrelated. That's absolutely right. So what we point out is that when you have a government who is operating outside of its own geographic territory. A lot of times those constraints that might be faced by, say, a constitutional democracy. So you look at the U.S. government, you look at the government in the U.K. or elsewhere. What you have are governments who might be relatively well constrained domestically, but those constraints are either weakened or maybe altogether absent when we're talking about foreign intervention. The fact that that's the case provides a testing ground of sorts for governments to engage in, to develop and hone new methods of social control. And so what we identify are several instances focused post 9-11 where those methods of social control, which have been honed or developed abroad, wind up being uh, imported back to the United States. And so we identify a few different cases. We talk specifically about domestic surveillance. We talk about the use of drones in the United States. We talk about the militarization of domestic police. And we also talk about the use of torture in U.S. prisons. And what we see in each of those cases and in others, which, again, are are not included in this particular book, but what we look at is how those foreign interventions have directly led 
to or contributed to those particular problems, which people are now identifying and talking about in the United States. So what we're trying to point out is that you can't make that clear break between foreign and domestic policy, and that even countries which are relatively well constrained can still see this erosion of their liberties by engaging in foreign intervention. That's quite worrying. I know in the book you mentioned about Mark Twain's warning in a couple of essays that he had written, almost satirical essays. But, you know, those warnings seem to be coming true in that the foreign intervention that a country like the US are undergo- undertaking, they bring the skills that they develop or the new tactics that they uh, test or even imp- apply out there. They're bringing them home and you'll see the actual US police. I think uh, in your book you mentioned that it first started with the SWAT team. Uh, yeah. And the- so we look at... Again, a few different cases, but police militarization is a uh, a very hot topic in the United States mm-hmm. right now, particularly over the last few years. We've seen a very large discussion. This started really with uh, the uh, shooting death of Michael Brown, uh, an unarmed teenager outside of St. Louis, Missouri, in the Midwestern United States. And you saw protest. And the protests were met with police in full military gear, what's called battle dress uniform or BDUs, with high powered weapons. And people are looking at this and saying, our cops look like soldiers. And so one of the things that that we sought to do was to understand uh, how it is that that happened. It was a topic that we'd actually looked at before, but we had not appreciated the uh, international connection. So to use the SWAT team example specifically, what you have there is a scenario where you've got uh, race riots, which are taking place in the United States. So these are outside of Los Angeles in the summer of, I believe, 1965 or 1967. The date escapes me at the moment. But the LAPD or the Los Angeles Police Department felt really overwhelmed and unprepared. So you have a member of the police department named John Nelson, who was a former Marine. So he had seen combat in the Vietnam War. And he was part of what's called an elite force recon unit. So when we hear reconnaissance, we think about just just that, your your information gathering. But this was actually a very effective, highly trained killing force. So They engage the enemy something like 95% of the time. You compare this to other Marine units where it was something, I believe, like in the 30 30 something percent, they had a much higher kill ratio. So they killed many more enemies for man lost compared to other Marine units. And so when he was observing these race riots, he used his experience to then go to his commander, uh, an inspector by the name of Daryl Gates, who would later become the police chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. And he suggested the creation of a unit, which would be modeled exactly after this elite force recon unit that he had been a part of in Vietnam. This idea was accepted. It was championed by uh, Inspector Gates. And in very short order, This new SWAT team was created. Every member of the SWAT team had former military experience. They referred to it as a platoon in the department. So again, we're already seeing this linguistic link up here. And Mm -hmm. over time, what you have is this spread of these what are now called SWAT teams. So special weapons and tactics is the name that they're given now. The original proposed name, and again, I think this is clearly linking this militarization point, uh, they were proposed to be called the special weapons and attack teams, but it was thought that attack was too politically unpalatable. So yeah. that's that's one particular example. Uh, and of course, this is compounded, and we talk about it in the chapter, that you start adding in things like the war on drugs and the war on terror in the United States. You see other policies allowing surplus military equipment to be transferred to police departments. And you get this just this scenario, which is ripe for what it is that we're seeing now. And we actually even go back even further. So if we start to look at the what we consider to be the first origins of 
the militarization of police in the U.S., we actually go back to the U.S. occupation of the Philippines in 1898. So where you wind up seeing the creation of the first SWAT teams, you see that uh, structural groundwork laid actually decades before. Episode 149 with Sumaya Keynes on why trade should not be blamed for the loss of jobs, the economic consequences of her grandchildren by Sumaya's great-granduncle John Maynard Keynes, trade blocks in the 1930s compared to today's global trading systems to remove barriers and maintain peace. Not only do these trade conflicts that we're seeing now, they have history, there are amazing stories behind them. And and now, so when you when you look at Donald Trump's Twitter feed and and you read this, you know the outlandish things that he's saying, with every single trade dispute, you have a story. But right? you have some kind of domestic economic interest that's fighting with another one. You have so trade policy. The way I see it, it's basically the intersection of your foreign policy and your domestic policy. And and so you've got these you know these two two angles, um, and that just makes it. Amazing, uh, and and you know much more uh, interesting in a way than just bog standard domestic policy. And the, and the other reason, obviously, it's really interesting is because everyone blames trade for so much stuff that, frankly, it's not responsible for. <laughs> and so, uh, trade talks is also a way of saying, well, this is what trade is about, and this is what trade really isn't about. Um, you know, so just as an example. If you think if you look at the long run decline in employment in the steel industry, in part, that's because, you know, the the international steel production steel makers have just become much more competitive. But it's also because the industry itself has just become much more, much more efficient. There's been huge amounts of automation. So there's a lot of people out there who are really angry at imports for stealing their jobs, whereas actually before you needed three men to handle this incredibly hot and dangerous molten metal and now a machine does it and so maybe you only need one right but people aren't very but 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 technology is difficult to blame and so people blame trade uh, and that leads to really dangerous but interesting politics it's it's funny not funny you say that but when i was reading the economic possibilities for grandchildren by john maynard Keynes, he actually mentioned this back in 1930 that that would be the case that because of the efficiency of production, the amount of man hours he foresaw that would decrease a lot and people would end up having then a lower, shorter work week or find other means to which they could occupy their time regarding work. Um, so with some other conversations I've had on trade on the podcast, you, you did mention there that they may not be the cause of certain things, but trade would be a solution in terms of trying to minimize conflict between countries. And is that something you would have uh, come across in some of your episodes or research that you've done on it? Yeah, so that was definitely the vision for today's trading system. So in the 1930s, you didn't have this global trading system that we have today. What you had were these competing trade blocks. So the British had one with their imperial. They had trade preferences for their colonies. The Nazis led one. Uh, the Japanese led one in Asia. And essentially, the world was very divided, where you had you know, zero tariffs for your friends and higher tariffs for your enemies. And so the global trading system today was essentially crafted with this idea that those economic rivalries were very damaging and very dangerous. It would be a much better idea to link, to, to remove those trade barriers and essentially link the world's economies together. So another world war would just be too bloody. It would be too expensive. And so you would have peace. That, that was the idea. I think at the time, some people saw the architects or the, or the people pushing that idea as very naive. There's an alternative story, which is that actually... This wasn't about the Americans trying to paint the world into a happy, friendly rainbow land. It was actually because they were trying to open up markets for their uh, very, you know, relatively powerful exporters. So, you know, the, the alternative story is that actually this was just in the American self-interest and they were just doing what they do. 
but certainly the the nice war reducing story is a is a nice one. Episode 156 with Peter Betke on how F.A. Hayek developed his interest in economics through the Viennese culture and the intellectual hubs which were based on law, philosophy and politics and the mentors he encountered, as well as Hayek's observations of the nature of macro volatility, the growth of government, technology and inhumanity during his life. So this is something, um, it, it, the book title obviously is called F.A. Hayek, Economics, Political Economy and Social Philosophy. And it covers a wide spectrum there. And people may, who aren't a scholar like yourself on Hayek, they just might associate him in the economic sphere or spectrum of things. But he's, he's obviously branched out into the social philosophy. I don't know how early in his life or later in his life that became, or was that all more integrated? But, um, yeah, I have a, a great number of questions because within this book, you kind of deal within those four phases of his life. Yeah. And like, like, my my approach, typical approach, would be to um, my guess, like, how did you get into economics and your research? Uh-huh. And I kind of like to ask those questions uh, to you, but direct, you know, indirectly asking Hayek if that was great sure. because you addressed it. And I'd like to know, firstly, how did Hayek get into economics and what drew his interest into the Austrian School of Economics and maybe von Mises there? Yeah. So I think the the uh, it, it, this is independent of my own book, but I actually think there's two really great books that describe the intellectual context of Vienna, uh, the economics yeah. world that that Hayek sort of grew up in. Yeah. And one of them is a great book by Robert Leonard on von Mo- uh, von Neumann, Morgenstern, and the birth of game theory. And uh, what Rob does in that book is explain the uh, mathematical culture that was involved in the seminars during the interwar years, what the pressing problems was, and the intersection between the economics community and the Vienna circle. Uh, so the rise of logical positivism and the reaction to that and, and all of that. And then Erwin Decker has a fantastic book called The Viennese Students of Civilization, which goes traces back even deeper to Menger and then Bambavik and Wieser. And then again, this Viennese culture of what he calls the therapeutic culture that they had. It was part of the whole uh, way that they viewed the interrelationship between the expert and the body politic, the body society, the body economy, um, and the way that they approach that and where the Austrians fit in and all of that and why that that culture matters besides the fact that Viennese – Fin de Sickle, Vienna is one of the great flourishing intellectual uh, you know, hubs of the, in, 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 in Western history is the fact that the way that they taught economics – um, was embedded within a set of uh, law, politics, philosophy kind of setting that Hayek learned his economics in. He learned technical economics. He was trained in the technical economics of his teacher Wieser and 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 Menger. And of course, you know Mises is his relationship with Mises is kind of interesting because. He, in retrospect, later on in life said, oh, I never really took any classes with Mises. But there's actually a book which has a pictorial history of Hayek that the that you can get that has his report card from when he was in Vienna. And yeah, Mises yeah. was one of his professors. So uh, <laughs> it's just that, you know, memory is sometimes bad with people. Right. But Hayek came to work for Mises and worked with him for 10 years before he moved to, to London. And during that period of time. Uh, as he says, working with someone who you agree with but don't quite agree with the process by which they came to their conclusions became this motivating force for him in his research program. And so I think the relationship between Mises and Hayek, what they share, where they differ, and all of that is a very fruitful line of research for young scholars to uh, pursue. But but I, I, I think to capture that Viennese – environment that Rob Leonard's book and Erwin Decker's book do a, do a fantastic job. And I just sort of pick up uh, from aspects of that. And what I'm concerned with is the evolution of Hayek's ideas over the course of his career in which the way – it's a one-sided debate in some sense because I'm talking about Hayek's own – evolution as opposed to the evolution of economic thought in general yeah. or uh, how he how his opponents responded back to him. It's more a book of laying out how Hayek himself uh, 
tried to deepen his understanding of economics by constantly going back to these roots in the broader disciplines of political economy and eventually social philosophy to get at the underlying institutional environment within which technical economics plays itself out like the the you know so you know to understand the relationship between interest rates and the pattern of investment it's one thing to talk about the problem of imputation and evaluation and expectations and those are really important ideas but it's also important to remember that that all takes place within an institutional environment which structures the flow of savings into investment funds and, you know, can, you know, where, how, what influences the, the interest rate at any particular time and what interest contracts for investment and, and, you know, do we have a shorter term time horizon? Do we have a longer term time horizon and how that relates to the institutional environment? And so what the book is really about, what I call the term that I call is this um, epistemic institutionalism that Hayek keeps on wanting to get a deeper understanding of how alternative institutional environments in the polity, in the uh, society um, and in the economy, specifically how these alternative institutional arrangements impact the way economic actors learn as opposed to the way a lot of the new institutional economics was done in the post-World War II period, which was to see how alternative institutional arrangements impact the incentives that economic actors face. And so both of those things are at work to get a full understanding. But Hayek's particular unique emphasis was on this idea of learning, social learning. How is it that actors come to know what it is that's in their interest to pursue, right? And those kind of questions. Yeah. And I, what you were just saying, Durham, he was interested in it, how the actors would learn and, you know, based on what they may have experienced. But he was always, based on what you were saying from what I read in your book, he was actually always learning himself. He wanted to be more expansive in terms of his knowledge. And he never settled on a theory. Uh, as such, he always wanted to make improvements. And perhaps he was never satisfied and because of um, maybe the social changes, the political changes that was going on during his lifetime. And this guy, he lived, he was like, he was born in 1899 and lived to the year, um, to the age of 92. Yeah. So he has been through it all in terms of, you know, the, the great, the world wars, the great depression and yeah. the 1970s, the communism, the, the rise of, um, I suppose, uh, you know, what, what, whatever, the, you know, the, yeah. there was no longer Democrats and Republicans, say, in the US, and yeah. you had the, the, the Tea Party and maybe, uh, liber and the uh, libertarianism, uh, liberty. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how much he knew about that because he's pretty old, yeah. you know, at that time. But I think you're right that one of the things, and I think this is true for all these thinkers, and I sometimes, I think sometimes we can overplay it too much if you do the contextualization. And only contextualization is if they're bound by their time. Mm. But I think you can make just as much an error if you disembody them from their time. I mean, they're economists. Economists are social scientists. They're not uh, physicists, right? I mean, and they're very much engaged in the world. They see a lot of their subject matters right outside their window. Mm. So what I try to do in the very beginning of the book is just give a glimpse of the nature of macro volatility that he lived through. Uh, the, uh, uh, the nature of the growth of government that he lived through. I mean, it was, you know, um, as well as like just some of the impressionistic things about technological change and whatnot. But one of the big ones is also the inhumanity of man towards man, right? So he was a soldier during World War I. Okay. He was on the front, you know, he was on the front lines in, in Italy. So he sees that. Uh, you know, he comes home, he sees this sort of seismic changes going on in Vienna uh, and the unrest, the Red Vienna kind of period and all of that. Um, that has unemployment rates and, uh, you know, other kinds of issues. He's forced to kind of leave. All of his friends have to leave Vienna because of the uh, the rise of Hitler and the threat of fascism. Uh, he goes to Britain and, you know, he uh, ha is there during the middle of the Great Depression, you know, living through all of that. Um, comes to the United States, um, has to deal in the immediate post World War II period in which you have, you know, a group of economists arguing that we we're going to have a 
post-war stagnation and then have the opposite happen. But yet the ideas that claim to have the post-war stagnation don't get defeated, you know, because of that. Um, and yet at the same time, a rise of, uh, you know, socialist ideas and, and whatnot. And at the same time, the revelations about socialism are starting to come out. You know, so it's not just such a rosy picture about that they survived the Great Depression and they helped uh, win the Great Patriotic War. You're now learning about, you know, the Ukrainian famine and, and the sort of deaths, the show trials and all these things. That's all part of the background. It's not like Hayek had to write on it, but it's like the stuff that he's reading every day when he picks up, you know, the newspaper that's right in front of him. And I think in a lot of ways, how can that not impact the social scientists? I mean, we. We have that happen to us. You know, we ride to work and we listen to news in the morning. And, you know, if you're here in the United States, you're listening to a running commentary on tweets by a crazy guy. Right. Yeah. And, so, you know, you're like, what the hell is he talking about now? You know, and so you go to work and you sit down. It's very hard to disembody yourself from that world that we live in in order to just work on your little projects. And so I think that for a thinker like Hayek, who was very much engaged in a idea that the economic way of thinking can improve our understanding of the world and basis on that understanding, we mm -hmm. can improve the polity within which we interact at such a broad level. That's not just policy, but it's actually the entire polity. How can I make democracy work better than it currently is? What are the pressure points on a democratic society that need to be have release valves or something so that we can actually make democracy work? And I at the end of the book, I get to those kind of things where I talk about the the structure of the argument for liberalism, where liberalism could maybe be reconstructed today to face the challenges of the 21st century that I see coming from right wing and left wing uh, you know, populism that exists. I mean, in Europe, the populist threat is just as dangerous, if not more. I mean, think about what's going on in Hungary right now, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's a populist, uh, right wing populist threat or in Germany or in Austria itself, right? And so I'm trying to, uh, you know, uh, see a way in which you could get an, a vision of cosmopolitan liberalism to offer as an alternative to populism based on the kind of evolution that Hayek had. And, and I'm probably talking too much, but just to, the, to follow up on your one point, I mean, one of the great advantages or what I want to try to get across in the book, because what I really want to get across is I'm not writing a book about Hayek the man. So it, I don't want it to be limited to Hayek the man. He was a, a an individual – who lived a fascinating life. He was a fallible human being. So I'm sure there's things that, you know, are warts and all. And those will come out in like Bruce Caldwell's biography on Hayek and other works that are doing that. What I was trying to look at was the evolution of a Hayekianism. And the way, and, and in doing that, one of the things that's the biggest sort of leverage for that is actually the fact that Hayek himself was a lifelong learner. He was taking bites of an apple and then finding that in response, people didn't buy his original argument. And so therefore he made adjustments or he didn't like the conclusions of his own argument. And so then he made adjustments. And that's true for whether or not we're talking about things like money and monetary policy or we're talking about the – uh, the nature of the political structure of a free and uh, free and responsible citizenry, right? And finally, episode 163 with Kevin Kelly on technology of the future, such as AI and AOR, to help quantify and track our movements and expressions to help with our decision making. Just when you said about the, the genome and there was a blockchain, yeah. I, I, I just started thinking, like, all our actions, everything that we do on Earth, Mm-hmm. Is that built into our kind of like our our matrix, the DNA that we have, and we're mm -hmm. only kind of we're mm -hmm. creating a more tangible experience of what is expected mm -hmm. of us as a human species? Mm -hmm. You know, I suppose this is a philosophical yeah. question. It, it it is it is it is it's just like you know, I, I believe that there are limits to what is possible given the physics of chemistry and, and just physics. And so I, I think that we can certainly as a humans, we can imagine things 
that may not be possible to make. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, you know, for maybe, you know, time travel is one of them. I don't know, mm-hmm. but, um, uh, it's, I think there are limits by, by the nature of the fact that you have atoms, which are limited and their, their forces are limited. There are certain things that are predisposed and some things are easier to make than other things because the, the physics are geared in that direction. And that means that, you know, some technologies are going to be easier to discover than others. And one of, you know, one of the, I think one of the points that Tyler has been making, Cohen's been making recently about that, that, that there, that there, we may have already come up with all the easy things to discover. We may be having gone through them and we may be pushing against ones that are going to be a lot harder to discover. Um, or even invent because we're up against the limits of, of what chemistry and physics allow and, um, or, or other economic, um, inevitabilities. And so I, 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 I'm a little bit more of a technological determinist than most. Um, but I want to emphasize that even though the, these larger, the larger valley in which the river runs is, constrained that we still have a huge arena to meander in and we have a huge a number of choices that really make a difference to us again the internet might have been inevitable but not the character of it and if it had been commercialized it would have been a very different thing and that is important so we still have plenty of choice to make but the choices i think are in the specifics and the character rather than the general form like I, I, I agree with you about pref- um, preferring a deterministic technological progress because you can prepare for it, but uh, being aware of the stochastic nature or perhaps mm-hmm. the random or the unknown, it's very difficult to prepare for that. And I just think back when you just say it, the alchemists, how they spend so much time trying to use metals to create gold and silver. What, you know, how, if, 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 are there technologies or are there advancements in different types of the sciences that you're able to spot and know that it's an alchemist type of venture and you would you can quickly come to the conclusion, just like the way you said about blockchain, yeah, that it is in the distant future and you would rather concentrate on things. Now, I suppose, yeah, I did answer that in a way, didn't you, with AI and VR? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think time travel is... I think we're so far f- from being able to you know, do anything near the speed of light that, you know, um, it, it, there, there always should be, and we should be allowed to pursue our, our, um, our investigations, what we want to do. But in terms of like, do we want to have a government backed p- uh, program to do time travel? No, I think that's a, that's way premature. It's, uh, that'd be a waste of resources. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so are there other evident ones that obviously can't happen right now? You know, um, I think longevity of uh, the, or immortality, I, mean, I wouldn't say longevity, but immortality, the, the, the kind of the version that downloading a human into, downloading a mind into a human, I mean, excuse me, downloading a human mind into a robot, into an AI, I think that is, so far off that while yeah you can you can kind of speculate there but i, I wouldn't i think it would be having a government uh, program to 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 try and do that is would be a waste at this point okay cuz there's cuz 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 we we don't know so much that that is just way too uh quite too glitchy. early too, too glitchy yeah uh-huh. so 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 yeah so i think there are some some things that um uh, in other words, I believe these are progressive developmental things. It's like, it's like when you're, when you're eight year old, you, you want to already, um, have your invest retirement account or whatever. I mean, it's just like you, you have to go through some, you have to be, you have to go through some processes and it's too early to, to, to do some of that. And I think, um, we're, we also have a technological progression, um, and that you can't skip too many uh, steps ahead. And so in the world of innovation, you know, being ahead too early is almost as bad as being too late. Yes. Um, 
there is this idea of the adjacent possible. What you the, the best innovations are always one that are just one or two steps away. They aren't five steps away. You, you have to kind of take the culture and you um, want to have the next adjacent step that that is what we're looking for. That's where the the work gets done. If you're five adjacent steps, then the society can't make that many jumps all at once. And I suppose we can only rely on the limited infrastructure that we have, for well, example. Exactly. And, and then you have the internet, which is a limited infrastructure, but it still gives us a lot of possibilities. And again, in your book, you mentioned about sharing and how we would access and share um even tangibles, not only intangibles like music or whatever, uh, audio books, but we are moving into a sharing economy and the, only for the internet. We have Airbnb, Uber, Stripe, or not Stripe, sorry, Lyft, yeah. and whatever other elements like company businesses are being set up to have more of a communal type of a shop whereby people can borrow a lawnmower without having to own one. Sure. Uh, laundromats were probably the, one of the first things that had set that up. Yeah, and there there's companies that do you subscribe. The idea yeah. is you shift to a subscription, you subscribe to clothing, yeah. where you yes. wear clothes once or twice, and then you pass them on. They're cleaned, and, and someone else wears them. Um, and so, so, so you could kind of imagine, you know, a digital nomad um, living a life where you technically don't own very much and the smart environment around you is providing your needs like the old uh, hunter gatherer who's gliding through the forest um, carrying nothing they pick whenever he or she needs a tool they find something in the environment and they make the tool they use it they leave behind and they move on and so um, we could have this version where the environment is so smart it's anticipating what you need even before you know it so it's delivering something to you the moment that you need it, um, and it, you leave it behind. It's recycled, used on, whatever, and you have a smart environment that is um, supporting and providing for you. And um, you know, some people will find that creepy. They don't want AIs anticipating what they want, what you, what you want. But other people are going to crave that. Um, you know, it's like if, if your AI assistant is really monitoring your day and your calendar and your movements, it should be able to request the Uber before you even, before you request it so that you just walk out and the car is at the door. Um, because they know your habits, they know how you work, they know what the conversation is going. And so they, 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 they summon the car to be there when you walk out. So you don't even have to order it. So that's the kind of an idea where the smart environment is providing for you and that you aren't really technically owning things, although you're paying for them. It's not that they're free. It's just that you don't have that relationship of, of ownership. I would subscribe to that minimalistic approach, <laughs> to be honest. And I bet those guys who are on Quantified Self, they, you know, you are all leading this type of artificial intelligence in a way, even before the technology may be rolled out on a more mainstream level, because I, I, I don't know exactly what you would quantify. Would it be eating? Mm -hmm. Would it be calorie intake? Would it be the, like, for example, your Fitbit could record all your mm -hmm. footsteps on heart race, uh, heart beating and everything. So if they're able to anticipate how they're more productive and work based on maybe the amount of efficient time rather than actual time itself for the productive outcome, that is great. Yeah. For them. Yeah, see, uh, the the one the, I'm agreeing with you, but with, with, except for the one thing about efficiency, I think efficiencies are for robots. I think humans should not be concerned with efficiency. Oh no, but what I mean by if they if they're able to quantify themselves and they know about efficiency in a way yeah, yeah. that they they're leading this AI revolution that they can pass on to artificial intelligence, so that they don't yeah. don't have to worry about those quantified self that the AI will actually track, like Alexa, yes. for example, with right, Amazon. Exactly. Yes, yes, no. So there's a, there's always a little bit of, um, an art 
in the quantified self is how much do you want to pay attention to the information so it can change your behavior and how much of it do you want to be automated. But what we want is actually, again, to apply AI to this data because a lot of it's very hard. It's very easy to collect data. It's very hard to make meaning and, and uh, purpose from it. Mm. But And that's where yes. AI, cheap AI, has to come in. It has to be able to help us extract meaningful implications from this data. It's easy to collect, hard to understand. Um, and uh, the a cheap, ubiquitous AI w- uh, would allow us to extract meaning from all that's being recorded and um, work with us to try and change the things that we want to change. Mm. Um, and so part of the, the mirror world that I was talking about earlier, the, the AR cloud, is this idea that um, um, among the other things that we would track would also be our movements, our expressions, our emotions, where we hesitated, where we were paying attention to, um, and other things that would be very difficult to collect otherwise. But if we're wearing goggles and that can see things, that can track, that can face mirrors, that, uh, cameras that face back, that track our expressions and emotions, um, we would be able to do these other things about um, having uh, assistance anticipate or to, to have our our needs anticipated. So I, I think there's kind of like a little bit of um, four stages in a lot of consumer um, um, companies, one is to 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 give customers what they want. Yeah. Um, the second one is to give customers to help to have customers co-create what they want. That's sort of like what we do with um, uh, open source and customization. But the final the final thing is to actually um, uh, uh, anticipate what customers want. Um, to, 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 before they even want it. And that's sort of where Amazon's been going for a while is, is where you, um, you're, you're, you're being, it's, it's a kind of a synergy where the AI and the, and the companies are actually helping to, um, anticipate what you want. And then, you know, of course, eventually we want them to help us decide what it is that we want. Um, and so I think we're going to be ever ever more embedded into this AI. It's very far-reaching. I am incredibly optimistic about it. I, 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 I think there are plenty of new problems, but the solutions to those problems caused by technology is better technology. And so um, I'm very, very optimistic about where we're going, and um, I uh, can't wait to get there. God help all those politicians when AI comes about, <laughs> yeah. because they'll yeah. be able to read whether they're lying or not. <laughs> uh, through all that data. I, 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 there'll be enough fake videos that um, that'll be a, not as easy to do as we think. This all kind of brings us back to the beginning of the conversation. Um, you being somewhat a nomad, if you want to say that, have no we've gone to the point where we would could become digital nomads and you've stay, stayed uh, so true to yourself and your own personal philosophies mm. that it must be very re- rewarding to have gone through an era, especially the 1980s, of a stereotypical greed mentality with Wall Street. And we, we just see this in movies of late, but I'm sure it's all been there. And to be able to ride that wave and do something that you've loved with your work and the whole Earth Review and the Wired magazine that you've been involved in and um, it must really excite you as you say being a ver- very much an optimist yeah it, it's good we're having our anniversaries the 25th anniversary of Wired the 50th anniversary of of um, Whole Earth this weekend um, I can't wait to it, see that because it's streamed live and I yeah, would love yeah. to be there and when I saw sure. they did press this button to watch it live I'm yeah. all there well great um, I, I appreciate your questions your interest in my life um, I encourage other people to um, invent your own life, give your own definition of success, and um, keep making new mistakes. Exactly. And so thank be, you. Be creative. Thanks very much, Kevin. You're really welcome. appreciate it. You are an economic rock star, and I'm so grateful to yeah. have this opportunity to speak with you. Thanks very sure much. Thing. All, Thanks the All the best. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 
Economic Rockstar is a free podcast that does not exclude anyone from listening as long as they have a device to listen, download or stream. I have many listeners from all parts of the world and I truly am pleased to know that the Economic Rockstar podcast unites all of you through the common theme of economics. I strive to commit to releasing an episode each week and aim to develop Economic Rockstar into much more than just a podcast. Patreon is a platform that gives you, the listener of the Economic Rockstar podcast, the opportunity to express your appreciation of the show by committing a financial reward for as little as $1 a month. Patreon allows me, the creator of the Economic Rockstar podcast, to be rewarded and paid by you so I can continue with the running costs of the show and to reinvest and expand the podcast into other platforms or mediums in the future. To find out more on how you can help the Economic Rockstar podcast and have your name added to the supporters list on my website, please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash economic rockstar or visit the supporters page on the Economic Rockstar website. If you enjoyed this podcast, why not leave some feedback or comments on the show notes page on economicrockstar.com where you can also sign up and be a member of the Economic Rockstar community. If you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, I would love to have some feedback and for you to leave an honest rating and review, as this will help with the rankings of the show so that more people can find it. If you're listening on the website economicrockstar.com, make sure you check out the back catalogue of all previous episodes and interviews with some amazing professors and authors at economicrockstar.com forward slash podcasts. Thanks for listening and I really appreciate your loyal support. I know how much you love audio, so why not get a free audiobook with Economic Rockstar today? I've teamed up with audiobooks.com to bring you this amazing offer. Visit audiobooks.com forward slash rockstar to download your free audiobook now. Thanks again for being an ongoing listener of the podcast. Thank you so much for all your support during 2018. For those of you who have shared, who have listened, press play. And for those of you who have become patrons of the podcast, I sincerely thank you all for the continuing support. And I hope you have a a wonderful, prosperous and peaceful 2019.